Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. I'm Dr. Natasha. I'm Niaz. Happy mm. May. Yes. And <laughs> welcome to our monthly member call. We are giving you guys all a social um, social media sneak peek at our behind the scenes monthly call. And this month we are talking about holistic gut health and how it relates to autoimmunity and what you can do yourself um, to find out if you have a healthy or unhealthy gut and ways that you can improve it using food, supplements, mind stuff, and body work exercises. So all our favorite things combined yes. into one. <laughs> so yeah, so it's going to be an overview and we're going to talk a lot about um, some of our favorite tricks and tips and things that we've learned in our journey, healing our own bodies, and then working mm -hmm. with tons of clients to help them with their gut health and their autoimmunity. Um, and we're going to go through all the topics, but because there's so much to cover, we're going to put all the details in our member mini guide. So if you guys are members, check out the portal after this call for all the written transcribed details and pictures and um, everything for you to download. If you're not a member, you can join with the link and um, it's 30 bucks a month and you get all free access to this the past three months and every month moving forward, you can download the guide. So we're going to dive right in no, to holistic mind, body, gut health, right? Yeah, exactly. Because it's all connected. <laughs> yeah. So why don't you talk, tell us about the gut, Niaz. What does it mean when somebody says, my gut hurts or I have a healthy <laughs> gut? Amazing. So the gut or the stomach or your belly or your tummy, whatever term you want to use, um, is what they mean when they say gut health. So the gut is really fantastic. It's really amazing because it's the center and it's the core of our body, right? And fit like physically it's the center and the core of our body and it's also very much the center and the core of so many different things that can happen or stem from our gut so a lot of imbalances or dysbiosis or autoimmunity for example a lot of even just like mental disorders or disabilities can all really stem from having gut dysbiosis mm -hmm. the reason for this is because the digestive tract um in the gut in the stomach I'll use all the terms interchangeably uh, throughout the next hour, <laughs> but the digestive tract itself, it's connected to our immune system, to our endocrine system, to our nervous system. Um, nervous system one is very fascinating personally because I had so many years dealing with anxiety when leading up to my diagnosis with autoimmunity. And I didn't realize at the time that a lot of that comes from having a lot of gut dysbiosis because there are more nerve cells in the gut than there are in the brain, which is so fascinating. Yeah. Um, so a question that I get a lot from clients and from just people that are curious is number one, like, why is my stomach so sensitive to X, Y, and Z? And what in the world is the gut microbiome? Like that word is so bizarre. It sounds kind of weird and gross. Like, what is that? What does that even mean? So the reason that the gut or the stomach is so sensitive is because the lining of the gut itself is actually really thin. It's only one cell, one cell thick. So there are so many, uh, there's only so much of a barrier between our stomach and the outside world of the rest of our body internal landscape. So things like toxins or things that can, or pathogens or whatever that can affect our gut microbiome or the, you know, the environment of our stomach can easily penetrate if the gut is not in a really good healthy uh, state because of this one cell layer thick walling or lining that the gut has. So inside of, I'm like, this is a stomach. <laughs> inside of the stomach itself, there are trillions of bacteria, whether you want to categorize them as good or bad bacteria, because there are so many different strains of them, including ones that um, that are coming from like fungi or from viruses. So our gut is really made up of all these billions of live bacteria that are sitting in this encompassed little organ in our in the center of our bodies. So when we say things like gut dysbiosis or imbalance, it essentially means when we have too much bad versus too much good bacteria, we want there to be more good versus bad bacteria, because that's what's going to help keep us in a really healthy state and minimize our chances of developing things like autoimmunity or chronic illness. Um, and I know that you and I both, because we have autoimmunity, I'm sure, and I know that I can speak for myself here, but I'm sure that you also probably experience so much gut dysbiosis and just mm -hmm. tummy problems yeah. leading up to your diagnosis that I'm sure 
the reasonings for your autoimmunity probably came and stemmed from your stomach. Yeah. So this diagram that we have up here is what Niaz was talking about in terms of the gut lining and that the, the cellular barrier. So to kind of expand on how Niaz was describing the gut, I'm going to use one of my favorite metaphors that I actually got from my husband, Dr. Titus Chu, where he was teaching about the gut health and he describes our gut um, and he actually describes our whole gut lining as a donut. So stick with me on this. And, <laughs> uh, and you understand it. It. So really our gut begins from the opening of our mouth here and our entire mouth lining through the esophagus that goes down, our stomach, our small intestine, our large intestine, our colon, and then our anus. So that's the other hole on the other end. <laughs> when you think about those two holes, those holes are the center of the donut. So imagine ourselves as this, weirdly shaped donut and the hole that goes through the center of the donut is the opening of the mouth all the way down to the anus so that's our gut it's the entire track and it's lined by these cells that niaz was talking about so you can see here what's so what's why that metaphor of the donut was life-changing and so fascinating to me was because it really helped me understand how our gut is technically kind of exterior to our body. It's mm -hmm. like, we think of when stuff goes in our mouth, it goes internal and it's in our body. But the way that um, Titus or my husband, Dr. Chu described it in this course I was taking with him, um, it's actually exterior. So when you hear things like your barrier system or leaky gut um, or things like that, it's talking about that donut hole, meaning mm -hmm. when foods or anything, pathogens, anything enters your mouth, it's technically still exterior to your internal body. And what happens is it passes through things like your mouth and your stomach and your intestines. And it should stay here. If you can, can you guys see my mouth, my cursor? Do you guys, or maybe not where it says don't. normal tight junctions up here. Oh, maybe mm -hmm. you can see. Oh, there here. we go. There you are. Um, so your food and all of that should stay within this area, the lumen of the gut. And you have these cells that Niaz was talking about that are sealing the exterior of your body, the donut hole from inside your body, which is like the blood vessels and the organs and all of that. So what happens is when you eat stuff, it should get broken down into its smallest component parts. So amino acids, vitamins, minerals, these tiny, tiny little particles. And then they get here to the tight junction and our body says, Hey, let them in. And then they enter our bloodstream. Mm -hmm. What happens with what Niaz was talking about, like dysbiosis, infections, stress, processed foods, sugars, we start to get inflamed cells lining our gut. So you can see these red guys here are the inflamed versions. And when they're inflamed, they're kind of like not able to be really snug in our gut lining. And so they kind of get bloated and there's gaps between it. So bigger things like bacteria, pathogens, chunks of food enter into the donut, and they shouldn't be going in the donut. Only the nutrients should be going into the donut. So that metaphor, you, when we're talking about the gut here, you can think of ourselves as these big, weirdly shaped donuts and <laughs> everything that goes through the donut hole should just stay in the donut hole unless it's broken down and like taken in as nutrients into our bloodstream. Right. So as you can see now, the gut, like Niaz was talking about too, um, has about 70 to 80% of our immune cells. So when there's problems, inflammation, infections, breakdown in our gut, you're going to start seeing immune problems anywhere from allergies, um, skin issues, these sort of things. Um, but then it becomes one of the major, major triggers for autoimmune conditions. So mm -hmm. having a huge autoimmune community here, having like a good plethora of autoimmune conditions between Niaz and myself, <laughs> um, you know, we really look at gut health. And when we walk, when we talk our clients, um, through the process of their own healing, we always want to make sure that the foundation of this, the donut hole is nice and sealed. Um, and so that's a lot of the anatomy behind it. And we'll get, you know, when we talk about all the details and you look at the mini guide, you can, you can see all the science behind how that can trigger things like autoimmune conditions and depression and anxiety and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Um, so that being said, let's talk about the signs of a healthy versus unhealthy gut. Like, um, a couple of them we mentioned like digestive problems are the obvious ones, um, <laughs> But another one, I don't want to say it's my favorite because nobody has a favorite problem. But one of the things that I think is most important to be related to gut health is skin issues. Yeah. So Huge. excessive, 
you know, acne, hives, rashes, um, eczema, mm -hmm. um, itchy spots, anything that, you know, is eruptions in our skin, um, even dryness, um, brittleness, those sort of things are like new possible nutrient densities through, um, deficiencies through our gut. Mm -hmm. So skin issues, major unhealthy gut sign. Yeah. That's another one. Yeah. Well, I was going to say when it shows up on the skin, that's already like a telltale sign that it's been, that your gut has been going through whatever the dysbiosis is for a while now, because yeah. once it's hit the surface of your skin and you can visibly see it, imagine what's kind of going on. I don't, I don't want to say this to scare anybody, but like if it's coming to the center surface of your skin, that means everything underneath you, it's like, it's just riding itself all the way up. So that's why things like, eczema rashes and hives are so important to really take note of especially if you are um you know dealing with a lot of gut issues because once it shows up there that means that you've really got to tackle and take care of it yeah. um yeah definitely yeah. other ones too like dysbiosis are just really signs of like a not great uh digestion one that i personally experienced have experience is disturbance in my sleep like if I, if I notice that my sleep is not in a really good place, if I'm not sleeping really well at night, if I'm waking up a lot in the middle of the night, I will pay attention to like, well, what kind of foods have I been eating lately? How is my stomach feeling? Am I pooping regularly? Are my poops like, do my poops look good? Like I, mm -hmm. I go back and I like dig a little deeper internally because yeah. it could very well be that my stomach has just not been in a good place. And yeah. at that point, it's going to start affecting something like my sleep, for example. Yeah, that's, no. um, that's a huge one. No. Um, one you already mentioned in our intro was mood stuff. Um, yeah. so depression, anxiety, irritability, um, all of these things a lot of the times are rooted in an unhealthy gut. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is something that I found out the hard way too, because growing up, I always had a little bit of anxiety and depression. And I thought it was my personality type. I thought mm -hmm. it was my disposition. Um, but really it, until I started healing my gut, um, changed my diet, reduced inflammation in my body, I started to really see that when I brought that inflammation down and then something would happen like stress or I'd catch a cold or eat a food I was sensitive to, one of the first symptoms to come back was that looming sense of depression or a slight feeling of anxiety creeping back. So when again, when those things build up so much, usually it's at a point where your gut has been compromised and leaky and unhealthy for such a long time right. that you're, it's now impacting the other cells in your body and your brain cells. Um, and then Niaz, you were also talking about kind of all the understanding now of how the microbiome um, impacts the neurotransmitters that are being produced. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I know Titus is like, this is his jam. This is his whole <laughs> the brain stuff. But he was telling me about an article recently about how the bugs in the microbiome actually travel up and down the vagus mm. nerve to like enter into the brain and come back down. So that, you know, like people who study the brain are really fascinated with how like the actual probiotics and bacteria and stuff are actually transmitting to our brain from our gut and back and forth. It's fascinating. It's true. Yeah. It makes a huge difference. I know like to your point too, about healing the gut and then doing all the things you need to do to the lower that inflammation. And then when something comes up that may or may not trigger anxiety or depression, I feel like when I, so personally for me, once I like tamed down the inflammation in my gut and I got it into a good place, anytime something would come up that would otherwise cause me to have some bout of anxiety, it was almost like it quieted the noise so that mm -hmm. I could actually like pick up on the fact that like, oh, this is coming up. And I could take care of whatever that situation was. Whereas in the past, yeah. it was something like, pun intended or not, like I would swallow it. I would yeah. swallow whatever that circumstance was and just pile it into my belly or into my body. And then later mm. on, it manifested into the autoimmunity. Um, yeah. So I feel like once you kind of work through the gut and heal it, you quiet a lot of that internal noise that's happening so that you can see and experience things more clearly and actually know where they're coming from. Yeah. And we'll get into some of those practices and techniques in just mm -hmm. a few minutes when we start talking about what you can do to improve your gut health, including not just the food part, but also the mind stuff and the body work, which is where we love to talk about <laughs> stuff. Um, so in other signs of unhealthy gut, um, this one's really interesting to me too, because I figured this out the hard way, the hormonal imbalances. Mm. Um, so women who in particular, I mean, it can happen for men or women, but like for women in particular, 
if you're experiencing a lot of PMS symptoms, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, a lot of people start, they, they think initially, oh, it's a hormonal problem. Um, or it has to do with like my, my ovaries or, you know, my uterus or something. But what a lot of people don't understand in women's health is that a lot of our hormones and our sex hormones are actually detoxed through our gut. So if your gut is unhealthy, you're not detoxing um, like old toxic estrogen that your body has already used. Um, and so this was one of the cases for me is I would have really difficult, heavy, painful cycles, lots of PMS. Um, and it wasn't so much that I had hormonal issues. It was more that I had gut issues. So as soon mm -hmm. as my gut started to heal and I started to be more regular and have a better microbiome balance, that excess estrogen was getting removed through the bowels and my PMS disappeared without imp doing anything to impact the actual cycle or the right. hormone aspect of it, like not taking any pills or birth control or any of that. It was strictly from eating more fiber and balancing the gut microbiome that it was able to remove those toxic hormones. Mm -hmm. So, so for people who have hormonal imbalances, they want to think about um, what's happening in their gut too, because it's not just separated to your sex organs or your adrenals or things like that. Right. Absolutely. To that point too, like on the flip side of that, even taking things like antibiotics, medication, that can also then not only just affect the gut, but then it, on, like I said, on the flip side, it can also affect those hormonal changes as well hap that are happening. Also, I can say this very, <laughs> very confidently because this past week, I had to, I had to go on a course of antibiotics. As something happened, um, everything's fine. But my period is a full seven eight days late at this point, wow. and I know for a fact it's because of the antibiotics. Because nothing yeah. else in my life has changed. I haven't like switched anything else out. Like I'm actually like in like a very low stress period right now. Knock on wood. So I knew that it had to do with the antibiotics because it's just completely shifting the, my microbiome right now. So. That's why taking things, which we'll get into nutritionally, really taking care of my stomach and eating foods that are not going to cause more inflammation while also taking antibiotics, um, is just going to prolong me from getting my period when I'm supposed to be getting it. So it kind of works on both ends. Yeah. One yeah and that's a really great point. So if you are somebody who has a history of antibiotic use or um, really any other um, chemicals or synthetics or even prescriptions, those will impact gut health. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times it's just about understanding the balance and the integration right. of that. Right. So if you, for whatever reason, do have to take antibiotics, it's really important to make sure that you're balancing it with good probiotics and mm -hmm. um, a healthy diet and things like that. So people with a history of that, also people with a history of um, high sugar consumption or processed foods, um, high stress, like emotional stress, these will all lead to healthy gut. I mean, unhealthy gut as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the last one we're going to touch on before we get into what you can do about it is mm -hmm. Um, at like the actually monitoring your bowels and, um, we're going to show you a picture. So if you're really squeamish, this is going to be an illustration. Um, <laughs> it's, it's an illustration it's of, not my poop um, and it's not Natasha's poop. <laughs> yeah, it's a drawing. It's the Bristol stool chart, which uh, many of you guys are familiar with, but basically this is, um, the signs of a perfect, healthy poop. So really what you want is ideally a type four mm -hmm. where it's smooth. There isn't unprocessed food in it. Um, you know, it doesn't require a lot of paperwork, a lot of straining. It's just like easy, smooth. You have your first bowel movement before noon. Um, you know, it says type three is normal too, but I would say, you know, maybe a little bit dehydrated, yeah. um, or, you know, a little bit of issues just kind of digesting everything smoothly. But anything that goes from a type one or type two is on the constipation side or going to the diarrhea side. So I know when I talk to my clients and I know Niaz does this too, we always ask about their, their stool and their bowel yeah. movements and um, their habits. How often are you doing it? What, mm -hmm. like how many times a day, what time of day, what does it look like? Um, honestly, sometimes you have to think about what it smells like too, because mm -hmm. it shouldn't be very foul. Um, yeah. You shouldn't have to like light matches and <laughs> air out the room <laughs> after if you're having a healthy gut. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you don't, and, and a lot of people don't realize that you shouldn't need to use a lot of toilet paper and you right. like, it shouldn't be really um, messy because that just means there's excess 
mucus and inflammation mm-hmm. in your gut if it is. Um, mm-hmm. Anything else you want to talk about the? And the- also, like, I don't want to. I don't really know what kind of word to use here, but like the strain. Like, does it strain you to poop? Like, mm-hmm. is it actually difficult to do it? Does it come out too easy? Does it come out easier? Like, yeah. You know, some people, like, I know some people right. that are like, if they're very constipated, they have to assist themselves in order right. to like, you know, have the stool come out, which, okay, is that happening all the time? Because that's something that shouldn't be happening all the time. If, right. it, if it's happening once every so often, you probably are dehydrated. Um, but if it's happening every single day that you have to assist yourself, then like, that's, that's something to really look into. So yeah, the straining. And then also I, um, I jumped in there to say the urgency as well. Like you exactly. shouldn't have extreme urgency yeah. to use the restroom. Like you should have the feeling you should have a bowel movement and then you should feel evacuated. It shouldn't feel like there's still right. stuff that needs to come out. So when you get on the spectrum of things like irritable bowel syndrome, which can have neurological roots, um, or, you know, irritation through the gut, Um, Mm -hmm. that's where people have these extreme urgencies to be like, I got to go now, or it's really painful, or there's bloating, there's sharp shooting pains. So ideally, again, we want, um, our bowels and, and, you know, it's, it is good to take a peek at it before you flush it. And just to help that monitor, um, your health, because this can change on a daily basis, which is great news, which means you can start right now with some of these tips we're going to get into to start improving this and start shooting more for a type four (laughs) ideal poop here. Um, And oh, the other thing I mentioned too, like these are just pictures of it, but you don't want your stools floating ever. Right. Um, And to help you understand why is because if they're floating, that means that you're not metabolizing, digesting, absorbing healthy fats in your diet. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about density of water, you know, old science class, we'd like some things would float (laughs) on water, some things would sink. Fat is less dense than water and it'll float. So if your stool contains a lot of fat that you're not digesting properly, it will then be less dense and float on top of the water. So if you ever notice floaters, it means that you're not digesting lipids and fats well enough. Your liver Mm -hmm. could be stressed. You don't have enough bile. Um, And all those things are super important for overall gut health. Um, so, so yeah, those are some of the major signs. We have the rest of them all laid out in our mini guide. Like we mentioned, um, we're going to get into some things that you can do to improve your gut health right now for the rest of this call. But if you guys want more details on what to look for and signs and, you know, symptoms of an unhealthy versus a healthy gut, download the mini guide. Um, and like I mentioned on the beginning, if you're not a member, click the link in the description to join um, and you can download all the goodies from this month and the past three months. So let's dive into food and supplements. So these are all the how to things you can do to improve your gut health. Um, And I will let Niaz just take it over here with the food (laughs) a little bit because she is our nutrition expert. um, And she'll tell you just about the best practices for overall healthy foods. And then we'll talk more specifically about how this impacts immune and like specific healing diets you can use for autoimmunity. Yeah, absolutely. So I talked about the the, the gut as far as the anatomy of it. Another thing to really take note of is the surface area of your gut itself. It's approximately the size of like a small studio apartment, whatever the square footage of that is, I don't necessarily know. Um, But this is why diet nutrition has such a profound impact on the integrity and the health of your gut. Um, This is why having foods that are going to be healing for your gut are so important and why I I know that Natasha stresses it too with her clients, why I stress it so much with my clients too. Um, So the foods that you, I'm going to go backwards, but more or less the foods that you want to be really mindful of as far as limiting your intake of it are the ones that are going to be inflammatory. So for most people, For most people, I'm not going to say for everybody because some people can tolerate it, but for most, gluten, wheat are not really tolerable. Those can be quite inflammatory. Some people can tolerate it okay and they're fine with it, but for a majority of people, especially in this community where most of us are, um, you know, have an autoimmunity or have experience with an autoimmunity, Mm -hmm. gluten and wheat are really, they're not our, they're foes. They're not our friends. Mm -hmm. Um, So that one for sure. Dairy, again, same thing for some people, not for everybody, but dairy can be really inflammatory for a lot of people. Like we mentioned the skin irritants, eczema, for example, almost every single time I have had someone come to me and tell me that they have 
eczema flare-ups or they have eczema and they don't know where it's coming from, the first question I always ask them is, are you eating dairy? And they'll tell me, usually they'll tell me, yeah, of course I have dairy. And I'm like, okay, I need you to take a step back from dairy for a bit and see what happens. And almost every single time they pull dairy out, the eczema completely disappears. So make just, I want to pop in there and just say a lot of people think that it's just lactose intolerance and they think, oh, if I, you know, take an enzyme to help break down the lactose, it's not just the lactose, it's Mm -hmm. the casein, it's any protein within the dairy. So even if you don't think you have lactose intolerance or you do, and you take the lactate pill, um, it can be all these other components that can lead yeah. to what Niaz is talking about. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you for mentioning that. I mean, I personally, myself, I'm very, very sensitive to like cows. I'm not lactose intolerant, but I'm very sensitive to cow's milk. So anything that comes from a cow, um, as far as dairy is concerned, I don't really tolerate it that well. Yeah, every so often I might have an ice cream, but like I'll be bloated and I don't really feel that great. And like sometimes it's worth it and sometimes it's not. <laughs> but like, sheep's milk or sometimes goat's milk does not bother me at all but that's just me personally i of course i'm different built than everyone else is um but for majority of people dairy can be very inflammatory um and then natasha mentioned it earlier sugars so refined sugars are going to be incredibly inflammatory for most people um i want to say for almost everyone it's going to be very inflammatory so those foods and then also if you have any like food sensitivities or food allergies that are not common um taking those out of the diet or just at least eliminating it for a while until you really get that gut in a good place. Those are going to be really, that's going to be helpful to pull that out just to start helping to heal that gut. So once you pull all the inflammatory foods out or not focus on them, you then want to replenish with all the foods that are anti-inflammatory that are going to be really soothing for the gut. So these are going to be things like fruits and vegetables. These are going to be things like bone broth. Um, I love talking about like herbs and spices, like Natasha and I are both Persian. So we grew up using herbs and spices. So I know that it's a very big staple in our homes and in our cooking. Um, Herbs that I love are things like fennel, um, mint. Those are like two of my absolute favorite herbs. I also love bitter herbs. So like radishes, radicchio, cilantro, more bitter ones are going to start up digestive fire, which is going to help you break down your foods. Um, So I love to make sure that I incorporate some sort of herb or green when I'm eating something just because it helps it, it all helps each other. Um, Mm -hmm. Spices like ginger, of course, it's just like a known staple to help with stomach issues, especially like nausea or upset stomach. Um, Cinnamon, turmeric, Uh, Any of those spices are also going to be really supportive in healing the gut as well, too. And then I'm sure you've, you know, anyone watching this has heard the terms like probiotic and prebiotic. Um, Probiotics, which you can, of course, take as a um, probiotic as a capsule itself or powdered version. You can also get it from foods that are fermented. So things like olives, pickles, kimchi, sauerkraut, kefir, if you can tolerate it, um, tempeh, if you can tolerate it, those are going to be really great sources of fermented foods. I like to add like a source of fermented food to all of my, you know, to my bigger meals, especially whether it's like some olives or some pickles, just something on the side um, to help aid the digestion of whatever the meal is that I'm having. And then you'll have prebiotics, um, which may or may not be a term that people have heard of a lot, but prebiotics are coming from things like artichokes, from garlic, from onions, from leeks, from um, unripe bananas, from what's the bean that I'm trying to think of? There's a bean. I can't think of it at the top of my head. Um, Quinoa is another uh, food as well, too. So prebiotics are also going to be really supportive um, Mm -hmm. for the gut as well, too. So probiotics, prebiotics, spices, herbs, fruit, vegetables, um, bone broth. We love bone broth here. Love it. And if you're not, if you're vegan or vegetarian and you don't want to have a animal source of collagen or gelatin, um, bamboo, bamboo is a really amazing plant-based form of collagen as well too, that you can, um, source and add it to your, you know, to your diet. I also love to include, um, aloe vera, uh, as well. Like I add like little caps or whatever, like a scoop of that in my smoothies. Um, it's just, which is also really healing for the gut too. Yeah. So, you know, as we always talk about in this community and with our clients is always start with the food, look for Mm -hmm. the whole food sources and think about what you're putting in your body and the least processed versions of that. 
Um, and that being said, you know, when you really dial in and you start to think about what you're putting in and what you have eliminated, then you can start to think about supplements and supplementation yeah. because you can't eat garbage and then take supplements to <laughs> help your way out of it. It's not going to happen that way. Um, but there are times where sometimes the foods that, you know, because our gut is so compromised and we are eating those whole foods, we do need an extra boost from supplements to mm -hmm. help with a deficiency that has been happening for a long time or a process that has, you know, kind of degraded to a point where we need a little bit of support to get back to an optimal place. So at that point is, you know, really when somebody has looked at improving their food um, relationship, just like how they're eating, when they're eating, what they're eating. Um, then we start talking about natural remedies and supplements and things like that. Yeah. So for gut healing, um, then, you know, when it comes to all these like foods we're listing and diets we're talking about and supplements, um, I know it's a lot of details, but we're going to have all of it in the mini guide. So you guys can read and download and keep that forever. Um, honestly, like in the club membership, Niaz and I think the mini guides are like, the, the gold. The <laughs> like, <best. laughs> yeah, we put uh, we basically put all of our knowledge and experience personally and clinically and professionally into this like condensed, amazing, usually like 15 page spark note of all the topics mind body related. <laughs> so, um, if you're members, you can grab that mini guide after this call. Um, and if you're not, join the club and you can get all the past mini guides for the past three months. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about just off the top of my head here, you can see all the details in the mini guide are the supplements that are best um, used or most commonly used for gut healing. So one of the big ones that people um, might know about is called L-glutamine and it has to do with that leaky gut picture that I showed you at the beginning of this call um, to really help repair those tight junctions and those cell lining. Um, but that being said, this is something that's really important that you work with a professional um, and do some testing and you have somebody monitoring while you're taking these supplements because something like L-glutamine can actually cause um, what we call an excito excitotoxic flare in the brain if you have um, imbalances in terms of inflammation in your body and um, these leaky systems. So it is really helpful. It is available to consumers, but if somebody's taking it and they're not feeling better, it's probably because they have other inflammatory processes going on. So I always caution with that because um, it can cause like neurological excitotoxicity as we call it. Mm. Um, so, but it is really important to think about that. Um, some people are sensitive to it, but it's very powerful to help heal those leaky gut cells that we were talking about earlier. Other ones that are really important and can seem really simple are like vitamin C, um, really powerful and potent for um, not just healing our gut, but also uh, our skin and like hair and any of those connective tissue things, as well as helping our immune system. So vitamin C is a really easy, accessible, common one that I recommend if anybody's having gut issues or immune issues to look at just like the good old vitamin C supplement. <laughs> um, and zinc carnosine is another one that really helps with gut healing. Um, and then a couple that Niaz mentioned too, that are also foods, but you can get them in supplement form are like aloe and licorice, marshmallow mm -hmm. root. Um, and they're often in teas too. Like one of our favorite teas, throat coat, um, is got a lot of these soothing. They help with kind of like the mucous membrane of the gut and they soothe inflammation. They help heal and repair the gut. So you will see them on the label of these supplements that are meant for gut repair and gut healing, but you can get them as a tea too. Um, and another really great um, supplement for healing the gut is collagen, like collagen powders. Mm -hmm. um, and with this, like Niaz talked about, um, they are animal sources. So mostly you're going to find like beef um, and you really want to look for a healthy source of that. So like grass fed, high quality, um, no added ingredients. Cause some of the collagens on the market, even some of these big brands, they're adding like fillers and binders and other stuff that can, I don't think we even mentioned this earlier, but those are things that can destroy the gut yeah. too, like preservatives and chemicals and fillers that are in food, which mm -hmm. is part of the processed food thing. So when you get collagen, you want to get just like pure grass fed beef, collagen peptides. And for um, our members, we have a, um, we have a recommendation for a collagen with a yeah. discount code also in the mini guide. So yeah, sure <laughs> um, because you know, and I have, and I will name drop here in I guess it's not name dropping. I'll throw them under the bus. Um, Vital Proteins was a company that for years and years ago I was using um, when they first came on the market, they were grass fed and they got 
bought out by Nestle, I believe, and they change yeah. their ingredients and they have fillers. Um, not all of them, but some of them do. So you really want to look at, you know, even though it became popular and it's available on the shelves at Whole Foods now, um, something like I have it still unfinished in my pantry, but I'm not going to continue because the the recipes changed and right. um, the processing has changed. So yeah, so you want to look for these uh, high quality supplements. Um, and then was that collagen? Yeah. So collagen, but you can also, um, what I actually really love is gelatin and we, I think we have a mm -hmm. recipe, don't we? Is it a gelatin recipe? We do. I think it's from, is it for this month? Or maybe think. last month, which you have access to anyway. If you yeah, I was going to say it's in there. The portal. <laughs> um, but you know, I love making gelatin, um, cups that of like fruit, like stuff with fruit juice, like lime juice or like coconut mm -hmm. milk, um, gelatinas. Those are really great. They're very low sugar. They're high in like proteins and um, collagen. So they help with gut healing and they're just refreshing, especially as we get into the summer. So those yeah. are some of the top supplements. And again, you really want to personalize this. There's um, so in addition to the supplementation, what I usually do with all of my clients is gut testing. So we will mm -hmm. we'll run stool tests, um, look and not just like the standard you know, oh, my doctor ran a stool test on me because usually all they're looking for is like occult blood in those conventional yeah. tests. But if you run a functional medicine stool test, um, GI map is the most popular these days. There's also the GI effects by Genova. Um, there's a couple of them, but I, I actually really like GI map. It will look for mm -hmm. the gut microbiome balance that Niaz was talking about. It will look for infections, autoimmune triggers, parasites, tapeworms, <laughs> um, candida, uh, and it will also tell you if you have those leaky gut cells. Mm -hmm. um, so it's great to test for that so that you can match supplementation specifically with what your gut needs. Yeah. Um, and then what we'll talk about just briefly here, because this is a whole topic itself, but <laughs> your healing diets, which we've covered a lot in many of our months. Um, let me pull this up. This is a diagram that we got off the internet. Um, and Ooh, yes, it, I remember this. Yeah. So it's done by Kristen Nelson. Um, and she created this like Venn diagram of healing diets and, um, we won't get into all the details of it, but most of the people in our community are familiar with a paleo diet. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's, you know, I think it's a little bit more trendy to the whole food, the whole 30, right. That became really right. popular. Um, and there's a lot of overlap with it. Um, and then there's the autoimmune protocol or autoimmune paleo diet. So there, these all are considered healing diets that will help remove major inflammatory foods mm -hmm. and um, get you back on track. Um, something like the strict autoimmune paleo diet is very um, restrictive for some people. And it's not meant to be a forever diet. It's meant to be a healing diet, meaning you do it. A spe uh, ideally under supervision or guidance um, with somebody like Niaz or myself. And that way you can balance out anything that, um, you know, is difficult for you, any symptoms that arise. Um, so anyway, that's the main one that within our community, people are really familiar with because it involves removing major uh, like inflammatory foods, especially grains. Um, yeah. uh, oh. So you go ahead and talk about the diets. I'm going to let Kova out of the room because she's she's had it with this gut talk. <laughs> talk about yeah, I mean, diets. I I also want to just enunciate the fact that the fact that you mentioned as far as making sure that you're doing these things with the guidance of someone like an AIP. I cannot stress enough how much I see people or hear of people being on something like AIP for more than the three month, which is really like three to six months at the absolute max but even six months is pushing it i hear people that have been doing aip for years and years and they're wondering why their symptoms are not going away and they're wondering why their stomachs are still really imbalanced and it's because they've removed so much foods and so many categories of food that their gut starts to reject these foods and it creates a it creates a really bad like reaction to them. So this is why something like AIP, for example, while it is good to definitely take note of and incorporate as far as like in the very beginning of when you maybe are diagnosed or when things are really imbalanced, just to kind of help ease things off, um, but not something that you should be on for more than just a few months. And ideally with somebody who knows what they're doing and how, and then they can guide you through it. So 
Yeah, the idea with AIP too is to expand it once your gut starts healing right. and you might use it as a basic blueprint and yeah. understand that things like nightshades could be, you know, consistently inflammatory for you yeah. or maybe they're not and you were able to reintroduce it. But like Nia says, if you've, if you've tried these diets on your own and you're not feeling better, you're just removing more and more and more and there's less you can eat without a reaction. Yeah. Um, really what you need to do is work with a professional. <laughs> Our dogs are just like... Just, oh, <laughs> I think it's UPS. <laughs> is work with a professional to look at more underlying causes because it's not just about food. And as we're going to get into next, there's also mind-body practices yeah. that are really important to address. Um, but even just in the gut health itself, it's not all diet based. It could be infectious. It could be mm -hmm. toxic overload. Um, it could be SIBO, candida, um, other food sensitivities that are allowed in paleo or allowed in autoimmune paleo, but your body has created a reaction to mm -hmm. things like I've had, um, I've worked with clients with, you know, who had frustrations around the AIP or the paleo diets. And they were just like, I'm doing all the right things. And I'm, putting so much energy into the foods that I'm eating. And then, you know, after plateauing for a while, we were like, let's run some testing. And we found that they had antibodies, food sensitivities to bone broth, to turmeric, wow. to all these foods that are like being toted as like the healing anti-inflammatory foods. But it's like, if your body creates a reaction to it, it's not going to be the right match for you. So we actually right. had to remove fish from that person's diet. We had to remove uh -huh. um, turmeric and um, and then work on bringing in other foods that their body wasn't reacting to to get those nutrients. So right, right. you just want to think about, um, you know, these diets as some blueprints and they're great. They, you know, very empowering to just try food as medicine yourself and have access to that. But if you find that, you're not getting the results that you expect or want, or you're still struggling with symptoms of bloating or, you know, depression or any sort of like any of those issues, you want to work with somebody who can help you find more um, root cause and balance in that. Yeah, absolutely. So moving on to some of the other stuff, as we're starting to wrap up this call, um, there are also really important mind practices that mm -hmm. will impact your gut health. So like we talked about stress and those sort of things will create an unhealthy gut. Um, there's a lot of things you can do to reverse and improve gut health. So I'll let Niaz talk a little bit about some of the stuff that's important with those mind practices. And yeah. So we talked a little bit already about how the nervous system, there's more nerve endings or nerve cells in our gut than are, you know, elsewhere. So personally, like I mentioned, growing up with anxiety, I didn't realize how much of it was actually sitting and stemming from my gut. And when you think about something like anxiety, what's usually like the very first thing that you feel, you feel something very physical, you get the pit in your stomach, you get the butterflies, like, I don't know if anybody listening has ever had like nervous, anxious poops, but like, <laughs> that's me. I yeah. still to this day will get them. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's because like my body, my stomach is creating a physical reaction to an emotion. So a lot of like the things that we've already talked about as far as the gut issues or the dysbiosis or whatnot, yes, it can be from food. Yes, it can be from environmental factors. And it could also, or, or it could also be from an emotional component of it. Are mm -hmm. you somebody who's really struggling with something like anxiety or depression or something else that could actually be what's driving a lot of these physical symptoms that you're having your body as it is at this point, reacting very physically to whatever that circumstance might be. So, of course, talk therapy or just like being able to really emote your emotions outward and not like I mentioned, I used the an, uh, what's it called the pun earlier of like swallowing your emotions, mm -hmm. but like actually talking to someone and letting them come out of your body. So if traditional therapy is not something that is accessible to you, if you have a friend, if you have somebody that you can trust to just talk to and just tell them like, I just want to talk. I don't want you to give me any advice. I don't want, I don't want you to like comment on anything that I'm saying. I just want to talk out loud and get these words out of my body. And if you, even if that's not accessible, I love using like the voice recorder app on my phone, mm -hmm. or even when I'm driving and I'm, it's just me in the car, I will go, I will talk to myself. <laughs> but it's, it's really, that is really therapeutic because it helps yeah. me get these emotions out of my body. So that's, a, that's one method that I personally really, that I love to use. And I recommend it for a lot of people mm -hmm. as well too. And then of course there's 
practices like breathing practices, really like slowing the body down, slowing the nervous system down, coming back into the body, which we'll maybe do a breathing exercise before we yeah, get into um, that. Yeah, but breathing is another really amazing tool um, yeah. that can be really supportive as well. Yeah. And then when it comes to like the mindset around food, obviously everybody has some sort of emotional connection to food. Yeah. So it brings comfort. Um, it gets us excited. It just like feels good sometimes. So there's a lot to work through with the emotional and the mindset aspects around what food means to you. And sometimes that's like a lot, a lot of times the harder part of the mm -hmm. process. Cause I know for me, um, you know, I did get rid of grain, um, gluten and dairy completely. And I continue to this day to avoid it 100% because it significantly impacts my immune system and my autoimmune yeah. presentation. Um, so I'm, I don't regret it, but in making that transition, having like not having access to the way that bread made me feel or that a tub of like cream or ice cream would make me feel because it's calming it's comforting mm -hmm. um it does things to our you know our mind but also our neurotransmitters that is really satisfying and that we need to find other ways to meet those needs when we start making healthy lifestyle or diet changes so there is that mind aspect of like emotional connections social connections to food feeling like the outside or the other. And that's a lot to navigate to. And it's a really important part of allowing your gut to heal completely because I've, you know, worked with people too, who are doing all the right recipes and, you know, <laughs> avoiding all the foods and eating the healthiest, like homemade um, sauerkraut and things like that. But they're still stressing or controlling the situation so much that it's having this negative mental emotional impact on mm -hmm. their body and their gut and it doesn't allow them to fully heal. So reframing the relationship. Um, and also just to know, you know, we're not going to get on, um, get into details about it on this call, but like eating disorders are a really big part of people having also chronic gut health issues. So whether that's not eating enough, overeating, um, purging, um, or just, you know, having negative thoughts around your food, like looking at something and saying that's bad for me, or I shouldn't eat that, or, oh, I'm, it's my cheat day, like all this type of mentality around food. Um, and I know Niaz talks a lot about this, um, and how she talks about nourishing our bodies and our minds with what we're putting in and not treating anything like a punishment or, um, and so that's really important. So I think Niaz can give us maybe like five quick tips in terms of like turning off your cell phone or like being present while you're eating stuff like that, mm -hmm. that can really mm -hmm. help you ground into healthier gut habits. So what yeah. are some, um, give us like three or five of them. Yeah. Like, well, definitely like what you just brought up about like the languaging around food and your relationship with food. And you mentioned like the cheat days and I cannot stand the phrase cheat days. I always, anytime someone client, friend, family mentions it, I cut them off and I'm like, it's called a treat day. Like you're <laughs> treating yourself. And then immediately when I say that, they're like, oh, that feels so much better. I'm like, yeah, there's not that guilt that's attached to the food the second you change the word from cheating right. to treating. So that's definitely like step one is really noticing the languaging that you're having around the food. Um, as far as when you're sitting down to eat your foods, I have like a couple of like staple things that I always try to myself make sure that I do. And I tell other people too. number one, make sure you're eating in a really calm state of mind. So let's say you just got off a call and it was super frantic, um, or you got off a meeting and it gave you a lot of stress. Don't go from that meeting to eating without a pause in between that time. Put your plate down, take a deep breath, put every, put your distractions away. That's another step. Put your phone face down, airplane mode, silent, close the computer and just be really present with your food. I feel like we've, as a society, lost our relationship with food as far as eating becoming like really more of a meditative art form. It just be, now becomes something that you check off the list that you know that you have to, I have to eat today. I have to, you know, feed my body. But also you, you get the chance to eat, feed your body. You get the opportunity to have this moment with yourself and with the food. You prepare this meal, sit down and actually really enjoy it. So eating slowly, really intentionally, really mindfully, chewing really thoroughly. Like Natasha mentioned with the donut, our digestion starts here in the mouth. Enzymes are built up in our mouth first before it even gets to our stomach. So chew your food really thoroughly until it's almost like baby food 
you know, mushiness before you swallow it. Put your fork or spoon down in between each bite. That helps you to also not eat rush like this. Like put, take a bite, put it down, chew, swallow. It sounds so ridiculous. We're like, we're not children, but we need to maybe start eating yeah. like them. <laughs> yeah, <you know. laughs> It makes a really big difference. And then another one that I actually really like to mention is if you're drinking with liquid or eating with liquids, actually put your liquids away and eat the food first because water will fill up the stomach first. It's going to dilute the acid that's in your stomach. Mm -hmm. Eat your food first and then wait about 15, 20 minutes before you actually have whatever your drink of choice is for, you know, for your meal. Um, mm -hmm. If you have to take a medicine or a supplement, go ahead and take it beforehand, eat your food, and then go ahead and have your liquids right after. Yeah, I love there's this um, Ayurvedic practice that they that's really easy for me to remember, but it just says, don't eat when you're thirsty and don't drink when you're hungry. I because love it. Our bodies have to, you know, process that stuff differently. And you made a really yeah. good point about the stomach acid, um, which I actually totally spaced on and left out on the supplements. But yeah, that's an important part is like our stomach needs to be acidic to break down our food. Right. We need to have those enzymes. We need to have bile. We need to have all these components that our body produces. Mm -hmm. And when we're eating a bunch of different types of food or when we're under stress, those the production of those horm uh, chemicals gets downregulated. So that's yeah. why when you're stressed, you're not digesting your food as well because your body's more in fight or flight mode, not in rest and digest mode. So it's not yeah. secreting the right chemicals. So those are all great, like really great mind practices for be calm to your food thoroughly. Mm -hmm. um, don't drink water with the food. Um, and those are all really great practices. And I think even from a traditional medicine perspective, um, having things be a little bit warmer helps the digestion too. Mm -hmm. So like having like I'm a, I am kind of a sucker for having just like sips of ice water. Um, it just, I don't know why I enjoy it more, but <laughs> I do know that it's not as good for digestion, like having yeah. warm water, warm water with lemon, things that kind of, um, keep that digestive fire as Chinese medicine calls it. Um, those are really good to help with, uh, healthy digestion. So Moving on into, we talked about the foods, we've talked about the supplements, we've talked about mindset, emotions, and mind body practice or the mind practices around it. So we're going to talk a little bit about physical, bodily things you can do to improve your um, gut health and your digestive health. In the last few minutes we have here, before if you know anybody's on the call and they want to throw questions in the Q and A, we'll do that live too. Um, so with body work. Um, we, let's see, do you, oh, I'll let you kind of wrap up with your exercise, right? We'll do that. Um, yeah. the breath work stuff. Yeah. Um, but some of the stuff, so there's a lot that you can do in regards to this. So I'm not going to get into all of it in these <laughs> next few minutes, but one of my favorite things to do for gut health and gut healing is belly massage. So mm. if you can get this done professionally, like it's heavenly. And I think people don't even realize that it's an option to get your belly massaged, or sometimes there's body workers who do what's called visceral organ manipulation, or it's sort of like body soft tissue body work adjustments. So a lot of that's rooted in um, traditional European osteopathy, um, like up ledger and that kind of world of uh, osteopaths, but also a lot of chiropractors will do visceral organ adjustments where they actually mm -hmm. go in and they help move your intestines around and break up scar tissue and lift kidneys and things like that. So if you've never gotten belly work or body work, abdominal body work done, um, know that that's out there. And I think any, anybody I know who's tried it is just like, how did I not know this was a thing? Yeah. It's There's a um, reason like babies love getting their belly rubs. I'm yeah. telling you, there's so much to learn from babies. So there are professionals who do that. Um, it's a little bit taboo to work on the front of the body in Western culture, but it, you know, there's people who do these very professional techniques, especially in the abdomen, but you can do it yourself too. So um, with that, um, you know, you, it's really simple and there's actually some better practices and techniques in which you can do belly massage, but um, essentially you want to move in the, let me, can I, is this counterclockwise? This is, this is clockwise. You want to move in a clockwise direction. Um, and you can go counterclockwise too, to kind of get things moving in both directions, but it's ideal to go in a, in a clockwise direction. And I don't know if I can even show this on camera here, but if I, <laughs> you're in your, your gut here, 
So my ribs end right here. This is my diaphragm. And then my hips are right here. So we want to go in that soft part of the belly. And ideally, when you're laying down with your knees bent, but you want to go in a clockwise direction. And just really, if you find a tender spot, just dig in it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I got a little shooting pain right there. So I'm just going to dig. And, and you don't have to do this deep. I really like deep belly work because I've had a lot of it. But just going in this direction. Um, and ideally, you can do it on your skin. And ideally, you want to use an oil for it. So yeah. you can use, um, I love organic untoasted sesame oil for my body because Ayurvedically, that works really well for me. But you can use olive oil. You can use any sort of body lotion that's really clean, um, minimal ingredients. But just go in circles like that. And if you find an area that's like a little bit sore or tender, just hang out there longer. Um, that's like the basic principle behind doing some belly, abdomen, body work. Um, and then the other one that's a little bit more advanced is doing some vagal nerve exercises or mm. vagal, vagus nerve stimulation. So there's worlds of information on that. Um, my husband specializes in that. So you can get a lot of information from the internet by just Googling vagus nerve exercises. But we've shared a lot of that with our members. Mm. And one of the most simple ones is just gargling really strongly. And this will activate your vagus nerve. Um, so just like when you're brushing your teeth or just get a warm glass of water right now and gargle, gargle, gargle to the point where your eyes water, that will activate <laughs> your vagus nerve and it will help your gut brain communication. Mm. I and didn't then, know about the eyes watering. That's cool. Yeah. Cause if you're not gargling that hard, then you're not activating the soft palate enough for it to oh. have enough inputs into the, um, the part of the brain and the brain stem that will activate that. Oh. And there's, there's another, when I talk to my clients, I go, you know, there is, <laughs> I never recommend this because I just think it's horrible, but like any sort of gagging oh. action. Um, so like some people would recommend, like I had professors who would like recommend like getting a chopstick and kind of just putting it on the back of your tongue to create a gagging sensation because it activates your vagus nerve. But I hate that. So like, yeah. I'm not going to do that. But the idea of gargling to the point where you kind of are like a little bit uncomfortable where your eyes water. Um, That's more tolerable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, or, you know, again, I'm my, I have a terrible singing voice, but even if you do, or, you know, you don't care, but doing chanting, humming, um, mm. even those like oming, those sort of things that are built into a lot of body work and mind, body, spiritual practices, a lot of that is about moving the soft palate and activating that. So if you even yell or chant or sing or whatever really loudly, um, you will get also activate. Out. Yeah, get those emotions out. So um, uh. yeah, those are a couple of like my really geeky <laughs> eye work um, things you can do. And I know Niazla's doing like meditation and breath work stuff. So she'll take over there as we start to wrap up and we'll see if there's any questions at the very end. Great. Okay. So we're going to do what's called diaphragmatic breathing, which is breathing from the very bottom base of your belly. So what I want you to do is actually go ahead and put your hands on your belly on the soft part of your belly, the same place that we were just all rubbing our bellies on. <laughs> and the reason I want you to put your hands here is because I want you to really intentionally inhale from your stomach. So a lot of times when I say inhale deeply, people are breathing from up here in their chest because they think, oh, lungs fill up here. Your lungs are going to fill up with air. You don't have to, you know, encourage it to do that. It's going to happen. But when we breathe a lot from our chest, from our, um, when we inhale or exhale a lot from our chest, especially if we're doing breathing in a really speedy fashion, which we're not going to be doing, but in other breathing techniques, it can actually cause panic attack. Um, mm -hmm. This is people who are having panic attacks. They're usually breathing from their chest and not from their belly. That's why um, you might have heard of people being in a therapy session where if they're having a panic attack, they'll tell them breathe from the belly, breathe from the belly because they need to move that breath downward. So we're going to put our hands on our belly to encourage us to fill our belly so much with air that our hands lift up and off of our belly. Don't worry about your belly filling with air. It's gonna, it's fine. Everything's fine. So hands on the belly, deep inhale into the belly to fill up with air. And then when we exhale, we're gonna exhale out through our mouth as if you like are sipping through a straw, but you're gonna make a whoosh sound. So it's gonna look like this. So deep inhale. All the way till you're empty. 
So deep inhale to fill your belly, lift your hands. And then And you can do this as many times over as you want to, but this is what this is going to do is going to help calm the nervous system. It's going to help calm the belly. So I like to do this kind of breathing before I eat. I just do like maybe one or two, you know, cycles of it. Or if I feel like I'm about to be really anxious or I have something coming up and I'm nervous about it, like a first date or whatever, like I like to just do a little bit of diaphragmatic breathing. It help, really helps to calm the nervous system. And then that help calm stomach. So that's one method of breathing. The other one that I like is also called box breathing, um, which essentially you'll just imagine like the shape of a box and you'll inhale on a count of four, hold for a count of four, exhale for a count of four, and then empty, hold your breath empty for a count of four. And you just go back and forth in this box shaped pattern. That's also going to help really calm the nervous system too. Awesome. Yeah. And we'll have these different breathing techniques and instructions in the mini guide. Um, and this is stuff that we've covered before. I know Nia's one month, she also led a yoga um, session for our members, which was really amazing. Um, and we, we, uh, am I frozen or are you freezing? I feel like stuff is freezing a little bit right now. Is it oh, really? No, you're fine. Okay. Okay, cool. Oh, end, you're um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, we do these sort of things in our member club and we will have all the instructions in the mini guide. Um, but yeah, breathing is really powerful for gut health, not just to get oxygen, but like you know, mm -hmm. I was talking about that diaphragm is a muscle and it's sitting mm -hmm. right between our rib cage and our gut, like our, our intestines. So when we move that muscle, the diaphragm up and down, we're also pumping our organs and our intestines and we're getting things to move for more motility and breaking up scar tissue and moving fluids and stuff around. So mm -hmm. breathing has so many benefits in that regard. Um, if we have anybody live right now who has questions, feel free to throw them in, but we got a comment here. If you wanna we read did. that. Hello ladies, I'm at work. I wanted to watch, catch what I can live. Thank you all for everything you both do. I've been a member since the beginning and I love it. Lots of love from Florida. Oh, so sweet, thank you. And she also added on that she loves the mini guides too. Like that's kind of our, I, I think our best kept secret when in our member portal. We I have, love them. They're just like gold little nuggets. Of I love putting them together. I like, they're fun. They're a good time. <laughs> so yeah, usually those mini guides include everything we talk about on the call and more, including anatomy of what we're talking about, mm -hmm. physiology, um, things that you can do yourself. Um, resources for more like books and podcasts. And then also this is the real gold of what we offer in our community is the mind body perspective of all of these topics. So whether it's hormones or autoimmunity or detox or any of those things, we always let you know what you can do, not just with food and supplements and things like that, but also from mindset, emotional perspective, and the physical body work, like we talked about from massages mm -hmm. to breath work um, to professionals you can work with. So yeah. yeah, if you guys are interested in that, um, join our member group, get the mini guides from this month and the past three months, um, and you'll get new ones every month. But it was great seeing you all. If you have any questions, if you're watching the replay, you can throw them in the comments. And if we see them, we'll try to get to them or answer them next month on the call. But it was great yeah. hanging out with you guys. And thanks for your comments and um, yeah, views and loves and reaction. We always enjoy oh. connecting with people <laughs> live here. So we'll see you guys next month. See you in June. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye. <laughs>